Hi, my name's Peter Willis. Don't know about you, but I've been aero modelling almost all my life. Now I'm a member of the British Model Flying Association Achievement Scheme Review Committee, and that committee's recently introduced tests for multi-rotors with FPV extension. And as an examiner, I could be asked at any time to do a test on a multi-rotor, so I'd like to understand a bit more about the technology that's involved, particularly the stabilisation technology. And as the British FPV Racing Association, in conjunction with the BMFA, are holding an event at Popham Airfield, I thought what a wonderful opportunity to go and learn a bit more about it. So I've given Duncan McClure a phone, and we're going to meet up there. Now Duncan's the controller for the Achievement Scheme in the UK, so we're going to meet up and see what we can find out. Hi Duncan. Hi Peter, good to see nice you. Nice to see you again. Yeah. Can you tell me why the BMFA introduced multi-rotors into the Achievement Scheme? Sure. Um, the, the, BM, the Achievement Scheme Review Committee, who really look after the, uh, the, the BMFA Achievement Scheme, like to keep up with the times. Uh, we became very aware that there were very popular classes of aircraft that, uh, that lots of people were out there flying, but for which there was currently no provision within the existing Achievement Scheme. Uh, and that's really quite, uh, we wanted to be helpful to clubs as well as members in terms of providing some measure of proficiency for these new types of aircraft. Which is why over the last few years we've introduced the, the multi-rotor A and B and also the basic proficiency certificates. Now the, there's a lot of examiners in the BMFA that have clearly been flying fixed wing for many many years, never had any experience of multi-rotors and I'm assuming that some of the members of the Achievement Scheme are those side of Absolutely, people so they yes. didn't know a great deal about yep. multi-rotors in order to so how did you go about introducing multi-rotors with with that lack of knowledge? Well the important thing is the the Achievement Scheme Review Committee whenever we've got a, a new area um, we like to pull in people with expertise in that particular area of, of, uh, of, uh, of knowledge uh, and that's what we did with the, with the multi-rotors. We brought in a number of individuals to help us and give us guidance when we were preparing all the, the new schedules and documentation. So. Okay, well, we're here where hopefully there might be some experts. Do you think there, we could there, find one to help there us? There are definitely experts here today. Um, one of them is a chap called Chris Bradbury, and he was uh, one of the uh, leading individuals that guided the development of these tests in recent times. So. Brilliant. Let's go and see if we can find cool. him and I'm, find out a bit more about these. I'm sure we can. Thanks. Cool. Hi Peter, I mentioned earlier that we were going to uh, find Chris Bradbury, well, uh, well here he is. Um, and the nice thing about Chris is, um, he's a hobbyist but also this is his profession. So we're getting a perfect mix of the professional view and the hobbyist view um, with regard to, to multi-rotor operation. So you can see why the ASRC asked Chris along to, uh, to give us a hand when we were developing um, all of the multi-rotor and the uh, BPC. Uh, the, the new certificates that we've recently introduced. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask him now some questions to ask him to take us through all the various uh, stability modes that are available on a variety of the different multi-rotor machines that, that he's brought along today to, uh, to show us. So Chris, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for no coming along to the ASRC all those months, years ago and talking us through and helping yeah. us develop the, the various tests. But what we're here today, we're trying to get some really or to provide really good video guidance for examiners. Yeah. So they know what to look for when these things are operated in the various stability modes. So yeah. if you could just sort of talk us through um, all the various things that, that you taught the ASRC okay. when, yeah. uh, when we were developing these. Um, well, I think the first thing to know is the difference between stabilised and self-stabilised. So for starters, a multi-rotor won't fly without some form of stability control inside. Okay. So they all have some form of brain which is talking to the four motors to control the speed, to essentially control the levelling, to fight the wind, to make it flyable. Okay, so that's what we would term as flight enabling stability. Flight enabling In other words, stability, without exactly. that stability, like having, wouldn't like be having a fly bar on a helicopter or okay. a free axis fly barless unit for a fly barless helicopter. Perfect. So yeah. for this to work, the receiver needs to speak to the four motors independently. So if this wants to tilt right, these two speed up, these two slow down. And to create a yaw effect or the rudder, you have two of these motors spinning clockwise, two spinning counterclockwise. So again, the brain is going to speed up two that are clockwise, slow down the two counterclockwise to make it rotate in the relevant okay. direction. What you then get beyond that is self-stabilizing modes where the aircraft brain can essentially work for you. So this is a fully manual aircraft. If I tilt this over to 30 degrees with my controller and let go, all the stability on board will do is try and hold that angle. So it will just keep drifting off. 
and much like a normal radio control helicopter, if I was to bank it and let go, it would just slide down into the ground. Okay. If you then get uh, the next level up, which is a self-stabilizing, which is quite often referred to as ATI mode from DJI software, so things like the Phantom 4 uh, F550s, which we have on the floor here, the ATI mode in that is when you push the aileron on this, it will completely roll over like any radio okay. control model. What ATI will do is it will lock it to an attitude. That's why they call it ATI. So you tip it over. And if you were holding the full aileron all the way over like that, the aircraft would only go to about 40 degrees. Okay. And then when you let go of the transmitter and it resets, it will self-level itself. Okay. So that's your first sort of level of stability so mode. An examiner could tell that that mode was activated by asking the candidate to, to Just let go those. of the sticks. Yeah, yeah okay. put a small movement in, sort of 10 or 15 degrees. When the candidate releases the stick, if it does that and self-levels, then it's in a stabilised mode. Okay. If it stays at the 10 degrees, then it's in what we should class as manual mode. So yes, it's stabilised, but only for the purpose of flight. Okay. Um, you then get uh, GPS, and the way to tell the difference between ATI and GPS, because they essentially fly the same, is in ATI mode, I said you can't tilt it more than 40 degrees. Yep. The same applies to GPS. Now, if I was to tilt this at 40 degrees and let go in ATI mode, it would just carry on drifting off with the wind. Mm -hmm. What GPS would do is snap and stop and try and locate a position. Okay. So it would stop it going anywhere else. So again, a good way for an examiner to be able to yeah. tell whether that mode's been activated inappropriately, perhaps. Yeah, is if it's drifting and they let go and it carries on drifting horizontally, it's in ATI. If it stops dead, it's in GPS. If it stays tilted, it's in a, what we class as manual mode. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, Chris, so, so what other uh, stabilisation modes are available too? Um, there's various Not different ones. Uh, when you get to this, this is probably the higher end of the hobby market before you go into the professional level. This has GPS on the top here, which is what this little mushroom antenna is for. And what this can do with the GPS is intelligent orientation control. And essentially what you can do is create an artificial north. So once you've taken off and you're positioned, uh, the camera here would normally be my nose. Mm -hmm. So if I put it into that position and switch into an intelligent orientation control, if it's now facing that way at 90 degrees, if I push forwards, it will go the direction the nose was. Okay. So essentially, if you think about flying a rectangular circuit, you could go right, forwards, left, backwards, right. But the aircraft could be whichever way it wants to face. Right. So okay. it's a way of cheating for circuits on some people. Um, other flight modes for this is um, waypoint positioning, and especially when you get up into the commercial one here, you've got things like cruise control. Mm -hmm. This can be programmed, or both of these can be programmed through uh, an iPad. So you put in the waypoints, click go, takes off on its own, flies a waypoint circuit, comes back, lands. Okay. So zero input from the pilot. Scary stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, Chris, um, maybe now you could talk us through the various um, flight modes and return to home and and okay. safety mode, sorry, fail safes. Fail safes. Um, well, starting with this one, because like I said earlier, this is fully manual, there's no stabilisation on this one. Um, the fail safe for this would be the same as normal fixed wing aircraft, which is throttle to idle and let it fall down out of the sky. So, something like this, you never fly too close to people. So, you know, inside netting, for example. When you have an aircraft with GPS equipped like this, you then have the facility for things like position holding, returning to home. So you could set a, a multitude of options for this, where you could have the aircraft loiter, where it will just stay still. Mm -hmm. So it won't go anywhere, it will just stay in its position. That gives you the option to walk towards it and try and regain control. Um, you can then have descend and land, so it will just come down where it is. Uh, really good if you're over a lake. <laughs> um, then you can have uh, return to home. And most of the return to homes, you can have it turn around, face you, or just come back the direction it's facing. Okay. So I normally have the aircraft turn around to face me to fly back. Uh, and that's a personal preference for me because with the switches I can override the failsafe. So if I know exactly which way it's facing, I know which way to take control when I do do, if that makes sense. Um, normally on your switch, on your transmitters, you'll have various three-way switches or two-way switches. So for example, with the small one there, I have, it's in acro mode, fully manual, but I can click up there and get high rates, same as you would with a normal model. Yep. Um, I can then go into this one to make it self-stabilising. Um, you can also do a uh, fail-safe return, so if you incapacitate it, just hit the switch and it will come home. Okay. Um, so all the fail-safes will work the same way. If the transmitter switched off, they'll automatically arm however you've set it. So if you've set the fail-safe to descend, switching the transmitter off will make it descend. Okay. Yeah. But you can also then manually enter it. I think that's really useful for you going through all those things because a key element of the test is for the examiner to be happy yeah. that the candidate understands how to activate and deactivate all of these various controls. Yeah. So this is actually a very important element of, yes. the, of the various multi-rotor and the BPC test. Yeah. So. I mean, uh, this is my uh, hobby 
transmitter, so I don't have it on here, but the commercial one, I have red uh, heat and shrink around the switch, okay. and that's my fail-safe switch. So all my crew were told, basically, on the day when we're filming, if anything happens to me, hit the red switch, because cool. then it'll come back and land. Yeah, I you understand. Know? Um, but again, like you said, the pilot should know which switch is his uh, gyro gain to make it more sensitive which one puts it into ATI mode or GPS mode or manual mode, yep. which one uh, does the fail safe, yeah, okay. various different things. And I think the, the other important point to make here is the, um, for the multi-rotor A and B tests, uh, other than flight enabling stability, no stability modes are permitted during the test, yeah. but for the BPC, the basic proficiency certi uh, certificate, all of the various um, uh, safety modes are, yeah. uh, are permitted. So. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Um, Maybe now I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking us through the various types of machine that examiners might encounter, but okay. also the sort of the multiplicity of various different controllers as well. That would be, right. I think that'd be really useful. Okay. Um, well, if I start with this one, this is probably the most common you'd, I see around anyway, and it's a 450 size quadcopter. And when you say 450 size, it's the dimension from motor to motor diagonally. So it's 450 millimeters across. This is one of my earliest ones, and I don't know if the camera can pick up the brain inside, but it's basically just a 55 millimeter square circuit board with a couple of accelerometers on. And the accelerometers are what you'd get in your mobile phones for when you're using some of the apps, so it senses the direction and motion of the phone. It's exactly the same thing in here. So if I pick up this one, which is my earliest board that I ever programmed, uh, this is actually a, an old games console controller, which has been dismantled to use the accelerometers to, to fly this. Um, this one here is a tricopter. So compared to the quadcopter, obviously one less motor, but the key difference is on a tricopter, you now have servos. So this is controlling the tail motor, and this will let the tail uh, rotate. Okay. So on a quadcopter, you can slow two down and speed two up to get yaw. Mm -hmm. um, with this having two motors spinning one way, one spinning the other way, it always wants to yaw. So you'll find when it hovers, it's actually slightly offset, and obviously that flies more that way, that flies more that way. So it can give you the rotation. Um, I would say in terms of what I would expect to see at a club, there'll be a mixture of control boards up to control units. Uh, the control unit in this one here is very high end, it's about a thousand pounds, so it's going to put off most of the hobby market. Okay. The unit in here, however, is about the size of a matchstick, matchbox, and it's you know, sort of five, six centimetres. And essentially what that does, it takes the signal from the receiver and translates it into the six motors. And with the unit you get in here, you plug it into a laptop or a computer, and you tell it what configuration of aircraft you're going to fly. So is it a quadcopter? With quads, they can be flown as an X, which is where you have two motors facing the front, or as a plus. Okay. So you have one at the front. Um, the other things that the uh, unit will do in here is all the old flight modes that we were talking about earlier. Now, the unit that's in here is the same as you'd get in a DJI Phantom. Okay. And when they come out of the box, they've got a little bit of controlness to them in terms that they can't fly in manual. So DJI Phantom, for example, straight out of the box will be attitude mode, attitude mode and GPS on the freeway switch. If you want to put it into manual mode, you have to plug it into a laptop and put it into manual mode for the first phase of that switch. Um, whereas the other end of the scale, which is where you get these kind of 50 millimeter circuit boards, much like you get in the racing quads here, their default is manual and it's whatever software you put onto it through so applications such as Clean Flight, which is a Google Chrome software, or Base Flight, whereas the, the units in there, that's DJI software and it's DJI units and it's all plug and play. Um, one thing that's worth noting is we get through the club I've had is people with DJI Phantom saying, I can't loop it because it won't let me. Um, all the control units will have some way of interacting with a computer. So for example, on the back of this one here, I have a little LED unit. Okay. And this does a couple of things. In flight, it will blink LED modes at me to tell me what flight mode it's in. So with this one, if I'm seeing uh, an orange flash, then I know it's in attitude mode. If I'm seeing a green flash, I know it's in GPS. If I'm seeing two oranges, it's in atti mode, but the throttle's not in the right position. So it's knowing the combination. Um, so for example, again, a green flash for the GPS followed by three red flashes means it's not reading as many satellites as maybe it should be. Okay. Um, and on the bottom of there is a USB socket. So you plug it straight into your computer, reprogram the software. Okay. That's interesting that the Phantom can actually be put into manual mode should, yeah. you, should you need to do so. Yeah, I think the main thing with the things like the Phantom is it's this whole stabilised camera platform. Yes. They're, it's not an aircraft you're necessarily going to be doing aerobatics with, they're marketing it as an sure. aerial camera platform. Yep. 
Um, do NASA V2, which is in there from DJI straight into one of these, and it basically do everything a Phantom will do, just without the fancy body in the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I think the most important thing is that, that examiners appreciate that there's a, you know, there's a variety of different... There's a multitude machines. out there. Yeah, yeah, that people could actually bring. So that's, yeah. that's the, the, the whole purpose of this video, is to be able to try and get some, some knowledge and understanding across about... Because, yeah. so, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to have assessed all those various modes no. and, until you told us. So. And one of the other things that I guess we should say is that later on in the video, we're actually going to be seeing all these machines fly. So yeah. we're going to see... Uh, see these various modes demonstrated, yeah. so I think yeah. that's important. Um, I think one thing as well, uh, when it comes to sort of assessing, when you look at sort of basic control boards where you've had to program software onto it, the person's probably a lot more invested into knowing how it works. Sure. Whereas the units that come out of the box pre-programmed and you just plug it in and it's almost plug and play, something like the Phantom, reading an instructions and then flying it is different to actually knowing how it's all put together. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Before I start this, one of the things that's important to know as well with some of the uh, control boards is how to arm them. So a lot of them will have a fail safe at the moment, this is doing absolutely nothing. And it's because I have to do a movement with the sticks. Now quite a few of the NASA stuff and DGI, it will be both sticks down to the corners or both sticks to the left or both sticks to the right, it will all do the same job, so I just go out. Some of the more basic boards, it's just down and right on the rudder for example, and then down and left to disarm. Uh, what you can do, which I do with my racing quad, because they crash quite often when you're trying to get through gates, is I have it on a switch. So I hit a flight switch and that's my arming setup. So just checking the last couple of things on that. Right, I am good to fly. So the last thing I check is my LED status on the aircraft to make sure I've got the right light flashing. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off in uh, stabilised mode and put it straight into a GPS lock and you'll just see what it's like. So to arm, it's both the sticks down and it's ready to go and just quick punch up and that's now basically a hands-free GPS hold so if the aircraft's capable of doing that then you know you're in GPS if I now switch it into the ATI mode it's just going to drift off with the wind so all it's trying to do is stay horizontal so that's the wind carrying the aircraft away if I flick into GPS it will just take over and stop so I've not had to put any stick input yet now in all of these modes I can fly the aircraft around and with my throttle on this one all I'm essentially doing is controlling height so if I push the stick forwards it will ascend if I let go of the stick and let it centre it will hold that altitude so this is when the aircraft's completely taking control for me so to descend I pull back and again if I let go it will stop descending um, this has got retractable legs which is nice so if I put this into ATI mode now and bank the aircraft to the right. This is full aileron. If you look at the transmitter, it's not going to go anywhere. If I let go, it will just carry on drifting. Yep. So if I now do the same thing and bring it back, and what I'll do is now, we'll do the same thing again in GPS, and you'll see what happens when I let go in GPS. So this is in GPS mode. If I let go of the stick, it will stop and hold its position. So what I'm essentially doing in GPS is nudging it around the sky to a new position. So here, I'd move it over to the right, and as soon as I let go of the stick, it just stops where it is. So that's, that's those two modes there, essentially, attitude and uh, GPS hold. You, you, can, you can see the, the GPS holding it against the, the little yeah. bit of turbulence in the yeah. wind earlier. Uh, what we could do with this, if I put the legs down, and just fly a little bit away over here is this is what would be classed as uh, fail safe so at the moment it's in gps hold it's got a comfortable lock and if i was to lose signal i could do this would be the equivalent of loiter and it was safe put okay and this would be a deliberate fail safe now first thing it's going to do is go up 20 meters or 25 feet facing its turn around to face us and it's going to then fly back towards where it took off from and hopefully it will land right next to your GoPro. So at the moment it's just now shuffling through the sky trying to find its GPS takeoff point. And once it's happy with that it will start to descend. So this isn't me. It's on 2.4, it's on a different frequency, so I'm fine. So this is, again, this isn't me, this is all autonomous. 
So what it will do is it's slowly descending and it knows where its rough altitude was. So it will start to like feel for the ground. And then once it's happy with that, it will switch everything off. So impressive. As <laughs> you were there. So uh, this one arms on a switch. Uh, the thing is with this, this is only manual, so very, very agile. So in terms of a loop, uh, if I do a bad loop here, what I'm doing do is basically just pull back on the elevator like you would with a plane. Okay. And what you'll see is you come in, you f that's not a loop, but that's what would happen if you tried to loop it like a plane. Okay, that so looked more like a flip to me. It's exactly, it's yeah. a flip. So flying in, build up the throttle, up and over the top, catch it as you come out. Lovely. Hi, well I hope you found this video of some use. If you did, let the Achievement Skin Review Committee know about it, because we'd like to be able to help examiners and learners to gain more knowledge in order to achieve a consistent approach and a safe approach to flying models of all types. So if it has been use, of some use, let us know. Bye for now.